We've been making our way through the Gospel of John, and today we'll be talking about John chapter 9. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Verses will also be on the screen overhead, and you can also find them on the YouVersion Bible app. You should also find an outline in your bulletin and an outline on the YouVersion app. Let's jump right into the text today. As he passed by, notice that, as Jesus passed by. Can I make a comment about that? A lot of ministry happens when we're passing by, doesn't it? A lot of times we get so planned out and so busy that we miss ministry opportunities. That ever happened to you? You've got your day all lined up, exactly what's going to happen, exactly how it's going to go. We need to keep our eyes open for ministry opportunities, opportunities to love other people with the love that Jesus has given us. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Let's stop and take note here. In fact, let's stop here and give ourselves a warning. Let's be cautious of making people into catalyst for calloused theological speculation. Let's be cautious of of seeing a person coming and saying, you know, this is time, instead of responding to the person and their need, we're going to get in a debate. Oversimplified answers that label and pigeonhole people are not what Christ has called us to do. Verse 3, Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Stop for comment. Jesus is not denying the fall of mankind, the sinfulness of mankind contributes to suffering. He's, He's not saying that this man and his parents are free of sin. He's just saying the point of this is not their sin. This didn't happen because they're worse sinners than other people, right? This this is a moment ordained by God for him to be glorified in this blind man's life. Amen? I think it's really important that we understand that. The church, we're trying to create a culture that we get on the solution side, the solution side of problems, right? How can we help? Verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am, the wor- as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. I believe Jesus is saying, It's now the time to work. This is the time. I'm here. We need these miracles to point to who I am. Remember the Gospel of John tells us that he's writing these things so we'll understand who Christ is and believe in him, right? This is the opportunity. Sometimes I like to stop a story like here and think, how, how would you think the story would end? A blind man now sees? What should be the response? Well, well let's read what happened. And I think we'll see some things not quite right in the way many responded to this. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, isn't this, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it it is, he. Others said, no, but he's like him. He kept saying, I'm the man. 
They're funny. He's not the blind guy. Yeah, he, he, yeah, uh, yeah, he is. No, he kind of looks like him. They're having this debate, and he keeps saying, I'm, I'm him. I, I used to not see it, and now, now I can see. I, I'm that guy. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to uh, Siloam. And wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees, that's to the religious legalistic leaders, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath. The Old Testament law on the Sabbath day, you do, you do no work, right? Now, it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he received his sight. So they're, they're trying to say, did he break the rules of the Sabbath when he did this? And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. The Jews, speaking of the Jewish religious leaders, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight, and asked them, is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed. Notice that? They'd already agreed. They jumped to a faulty conclusion. We see that some in our day, don't we? There's some questions that people ask, and, they, and if you answer a certain way, they, they, they don't want anything to do with you. There's some college and university science departments that if, that if you say, I have some questions about the evolutionary theory, they don't know if they want to hire you, right? I've already concluded. There's some questions, and how you answer them will determine if you're in or out. All right? If you say, I believe that marriage is between one man and one woman, all of a sudden that means that you're bigoted and full of hate. So there's some, some test that people put out there, don't they? In the church, sometimes people will do that. They have these artificial questions, don't they? See, if you answer this way, then, then you're one of us. If you don't, then you're not. I had an experience many years ago when, when Bush was president. That I was at a gas station. This was many years ago, and I was filling up my car with gas. Some of you heard me tell this story. And as I was, there was a guy right across from me, and he was swearing, like major, cursing President Bush. This is first President Bush before the, uh, his son took off, so you know the time we're, we're talking about and what's going on, and, and his son had been deployed to fight, and he was not for it all, and he was cussing up a storm and talking about how terrible it was, and beep to beep President Bush I'm just trying to fill up my car with gas. Got the scene? Trying to get out there quick. And all of a sudden he says to me, Hey, you! I stopped and froze for a minute. I said, Yes, me? And he said, Yes. Did you vote for President Bush? How many people here know that he wasn't interested in political discussion? He was trying to draw a line. Are you the enemy? 
By the way, I just told him the truth, which was I wasn't around to vote. And we talked a little bit about his son. But you know, there's a lot of times in the church, there's people who just ask questions, and they don't want to really listen for the answer. They more than just hear the answer is, you're on the other team. Right? That, these guys have decided, if you accept Jesus, you're out. And the blind man's parents were concerned about that. Verse 22, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. It's kind of an ironic statement, right? Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already, and you would not listen. Why? Do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him. Kicked him off, right? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, What? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin. And would you teach us? And they cast him out. John Calvin said, if they can't beat your arguments, they'll try to beat you. Right? I find it interesting that Rabbi Zacharias, who goes to different college campuses and presents the truth of God, has received so many death threats. Right? Let's continue to read verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? This is encouraging, because it shows that God begins working in a life long before they even know who Jesus is. Amen? This guy doesn't even know who Jesus is, but, he, but he's experienced Jesus. It tells us two things. One, you could receive a blessing from the Lord and not know him as your Lord and Savior. If that's the case, you need to surrender your life to him. Ask him to forgive your sins and be the boss and treasurer of your life. Amen? It also means that when we go about trying to share Jesus with people, we might want to look where God is already working in their life. True? There's a book called Lighten Up. It's another story I like to tell all the time because it reminds me a little of myself. The author talks about going into the kitchen, turning on the light. The light bulb kind of did that, and then went out. Kitchen was totally dark. Went into the pantry, got out the little footstool to climb up on. In the process of bringing that in, he kicked over the dog's dish. Water and dog food went everywhere. At the and got the light bulb stuck in his shirt pocket, I guess, and got up there and started stepping up there trying to unscrew the top of the light shade and pull that off, a little globe, the glass globe. And just about the time, he, he adjusted his weight just like this, and as he did, he, he doesn't know if it was a kibble or a bit, but one of the pieces of the dog food just lodged in that bad part, part of his foot. Now, some of you have had that happen when you stepped on a Lego or a toy in your kid's room, right? And it hurts, right? So instantly, he kind of went, ah! And at the same time that happened, he'd finally got that, that globe loose. And he fell backwards and broke the globe and the light bulb and mess everywhere. His wife walks in, 
around the mess, over by the kitchen stove, and turns on the other light in the kitchen. <laughs> and the point of the author is you ought to know what's working before you start working on what's not. Does that make sense? Another story I like to tell a lot is a story I heard from Bill Hybels. He was on a plane, someone found out he was a minister, and they said to him, I've almost given up on that religious stuff, that Christianity stuff. And Bill said to her, tell me about the almost. Why haven't you fully given up on it? I remember sitting there that day and it was like a, a lightning bolt hit me and go, that's it. That's what I need to be thinking about. You see, I, I would tend to go a different direction with that, right? I would tend to jump in and tell me, well, what are your objections? What don't you like about Christianity? Right? But, but Bill went, okay, you said you've almost given up. Why haven't you yet? What's going on? And he walked through that door. We need to look at the entry gates into people's lives, amen? This blind man was healed by Jesus before he even knew who Jesus was. All around us, people have experienced the blessings of God and they don't know God yet. True? Verse 37, Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I come into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Oh, how we pray for God to remove our spiritual blindness so we may see. Amen? It's much worse to be spiritually blind than to be physically so. Title of the sermon today, The Dangers of Jumping to Conclusions. Jumping to conclusions is a psychological term referring to a communication obstacle where one judges or decides something without having all the facts to reach an unwarranted conclusion. Proverbs 18.13 says this, If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. We need to be, as James 1.19 says, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. In our day with so many attacks on Christianity and so many statements, we need to make sure that we're good listeners. True? We're going to make sure that we don't jump to conclusions. Over the years, I've had ministry to drug addicts and people come and say, why do people do methamphetamine? Well, there's not one answer. You've got to know the people, right? They don't just jump to quick cookie-cutter answers. Let's sit and listen. Oh, how much better my ministry would be if I, if I learned to remove exclamation points and put questions. Right? You see trends in behavior. Why not ask a question? You know, the, the psychological test and all those things... They can't replace a good conversation, right? When we have some of these tools of helping us understand how people think and, and how they interact with one another, th they should be used to help us ask good questions, not help us jump to wrong conclusions, right? 
In the Christian church sometimes we're quick to say, well, women do this and men do that. And people answer the question here this way, do this. We need to be careful that we don't start labeling and pigeonholing people. We need to be in discussions with people, right? Amen? Well, here are the outline points. Point one, jumping to conclusions leads to handing out pat answers. When I think of pat answers, I think of oversimplified cliches. Subpoint, pat answers are filled with pride. Trying to know everything about everything. They're never able to say, I don't know. I'll give you an answer. I got an answer to that. And here's the answer. Pet answers are filled with assumptions. It worked that way before, so that's assuming what I'm assuming is happening in your life, so boom, there it is. And pet answers are filled with thoughtlessness. The disciples seem to be looking for a pat answer. Who sinned, this man or his parents? They created a false dichotomy. It has to be this or this. Those things happen often in our conversations with one another, in books I read, you read, where people make overstatements and create false dichotomies. Point two. Jumping to conclusions leads to looking past the people we are called to lovingly serve. Jesus sees a person in need of compassion, the blind man. The disciples see a problem to be speculated over, argued over. You see that several times, right? Poor guy receives his sight back. They're arguing about whether he's really the guy. Argument about this and that. Where's the, where's the rejoicing that he got his sight back? In the training I received uh, through CCF and uh, my doctorate program, they talked to us often in counseling about not losing the person and the problem. You're not talking to an addict. You're not talking to somebody who's struggling. You're talking to an individual. Get to know the individual. Amen. Three, jumping to conclusions leads to missing Jesus. Pharisees had their conclusions they jumped to, right? You don't do these things on the Sabbath. He's doing those things on the Sabbath, so he can't be the Messiah. We're done. How many false little stupid tests get put up in the church sometimes, right? They must not know Jesus because they did this. Really? I can't even find that in the scripture. The Jewish leaders missed Jesus because they fell in love with their own opinions and the conclusions they had mistakenly jumped to. Remember Jesus told us that the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second was like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. They show no compassion for the blind man and no love for Jesus. Four. Jumping to conclusions leads to legalistic religiosity. Legalists love to use oversimplified rules to pump up their own self-righteousness. Here's the line. I'm above it. Anybody who doesn't do that, they're out. Right? We could probably brainstorm together all kinds of rules that aren't in the Bible that we've decided determine whether you're really a good Christian or not. Right? I just wonder about some of those things. Five. 
Jumping to conclusions leads to being a jerk. Jump to conclusions is because of our pride, it increases our pride. We just become jerks because we don't actually listen to people. We just jump to the conclusion, right? Thought about softening and thinking, no, no. That's the problem. Point six, don't be a jerk, be like Jesus. In fact, if you want to take the whole sermon and just put it in a, in, a, in a sentence, what I think we can learn from John 9, it's this. Don't be a jerk. Be like Jesus. Don't be a jerk who jumps to conclusions. Don't be a jerk who misses loving people. It's more concerned about your little petty little religious rules that aren't found in the Scripture than you are about caring for lost people, hurting people. Don't be a jerk who doesn't see Jesus, who condemns Jesus. Don't be a jerk who jumps on somebody who's just giving an honest confession about what's happened in their life? Don't be a jerk. The world's got enough jerks. Be like Jesus. Now, how? We all have a jerk syndrome here, let's be honest. Right? We don't care as much about people as we should. We don't love people the way we should. We don't love God the way we should. So what hope is there for us? If it's just telling you what to do, you go, well, you know, I know I do some jerky stuff. Today's not about loading us up with guilt so we can go home and, you know, be Eeyore the rest of the day. It's about being set free. No longer being spiritually blind. If you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the, the first step is just turn away from being the boss and ruler of your own life and turn to Jesus. Amen? And then know the only thing that enables you to see you needed that was the grace of God. And then trust in Jesus. Ask him to forgive your sins, to be the ruler of your life. Amen? And then, then tell us about it. Mark it on the connection card. We want to know that happened, right? Maybe the next step is to say, well, I've done that, but I'd like the world to know about that. Then follow the example that Jesus gave us and be baptized. We're, we're doing a baptism next week. Love to have more. Amen? And if you're like me and you've known Jesus for years and you've been baptized, but you know the truth is that we've been saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. But you know that still you struggle with being a jerk. And just say, Lord, right now, say, Lord, help me. Help me to see you. Help me to focus on you. Help me to love people. Help me to set aside all those insecurities and insufficiencies and help me to focus on you as the source and power of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the fruits, the fruit of your Spirit. May I be filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. Is that the prayer of some here today? Is there anybody here who can say, I've already arrived. I'm fully jerk-free. And if so, we might interview your spouse. <laughs> I know I'm not there. We're not what we were, but we're not yet what we're going to become. Amen? Don't you want to be more like Jesus? You know, I am sometimes absolutely amazed at how slowly my selfishness leaves. How about you? I, I've said it before, but I've went golfing before and been more concerned about missing a putt than an opportunity to share the Lord with the people I was golfing with. More concerned about what people thought about my athletic ability than my Lord and Savior. I don't know about you, but I'd like to say today, Lord, help me. I don't want to be a jerk. I want to be more like Jesus this week. And I'm hoping that this sermon and this message, is, as we close our time together, you got your connection cards, if you could fill those out. We're going to take the offering if you're financial partners with us. And we appreciate that. And we'd love to have uh, you cheerfully and joyfully give so we can spread the love of Jesus to the neighbors and to the nations. But if you're here today, if you're, with this song that we're about ready to sing, I'll ask the group to... Life to come, and we're going to sing, Open My Eyes, Lord. I pray that it would be our prayer, that God would open our eyes, 
And I pray that this message isn't just a message for Sunday morning, but this very week at your jobs, at my job, with your neighbors and my neighbors, they'd say something different is happening at Edgewood Church because people, Edgewood Baptist Church, because people are being transformed by the love of Christ. Amen? And by the way, it's okay to say I'm wrong, I'm sorry, please forgive me. God gives us fresh starts every day. Amen? Be encouraged. We have a great Savior who loves us. He came to serve, to save folks like you and I.